looking at uh, Mark's gospel here. We're looking at Mark chapter 13, and this is our fifth Sunday and final Sunday in Mark chapter 13. Um, I'm going to need to take a nap after this one. It's been a, a doozy, but it's been good, and we're thankful for God's grace and, and the grace that He's given to us as we've looked at Mark chapter 13. Again, we're looking at Mark chapter 13, verses 32 to, to 37. Mark chapter 13, verses 32 to 37. Let me pray for us as you're turning there, and then we'll, we'll read God's Word. Father, we, we do ask for your help, for your, your provision, for your guidance now as we open your Word and and as your word is preached, we pray that your word would pass from my mouth to our ears, and from our ears to our hearts, and from our hearts to our lips and conversation, so that your word would not return to you void, but accomplish the very purpose for which you send it out. And to that end, would you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts during this next 40 minutes or so be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Through Christ our Lord, we ask these things. Amen. You can stand with me if you are turned to Mark chapter 13, verses 32 to 37. These are the words of our Lord Jesus, recorded for us by Mark, as he wrote, inspired by the Holy Spirit. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you... I say to all, stay awake. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. Now, it may surprise you based on the words we just read, but history is absolutely jam-packed with predictions concerning the timing of Christ's return. And the source of some of these predictions might not surprise you. This past week, I came across a prediction from Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, concerning the date of Christ's return. He said he had had a revelation about it in the year 1843. He said that in April of that year, he had been very earnestly praying about the timing concerning Christ's return. And he said he heard a voice tell him that the Son of Man's coming would be, by the time Smith was 85 years old, Smith said then the year of Christ's coming would be no later in 1891. And just a year after Smith's so-called revelation was the predicted date of William Miller of the Millerites. It's known today as the Seventh-day Adventists. He claimed that Christ would return in 1844. It was a, a, a date and an event referred to later as the Great Disappointment, since obviously Christ did not come. Jehovah's Witnesses Another example of this, they believed at one time, and, and still do in something of a strange way, that the year of Christ's return would be 1914. And such predictions are, are actually something of a common thread you can find in, in, in cults like these. But then also in, in, in the 80s to the early 2000s, among more kind of dispensational fundamentalists, uh, such predictions seem to be all the rage. You might remember this if you grew up in the church in that time period, some of you are smiling, you, you remember this. Hal Lindsey, author of Late Great Planet Earth, predicted that the, the coming of Christ would take place in the 80s, no later than 1988. 
His first, uh, uh, Harold Camping, uh, is an, another name. He's best known for his predictions. Uh, his first prediction was made in his book, uh, 1994, there's a question mark, uh, where he predicted that, that Christ would come back in that year. And they released the book, re-released the book uh, later, post-1994, with a different title. Uh, eventually, he came up with a different date in 2011. And that didn't happen as well. He said he would stop his, his predictions. He died in 2013. In 1999, Jerry Falwell, a name you guys probably have heard before, Jerry Falwell predicted it would happen by 2009. Everybody and their mom in these kinds of circles predicted that it would happen in 2000, if you remember that, the, the 2000, uh, the, the turn of the millennium. People were predicting that Christ would, would return in that time. That's just a few from that time period. And then there's some more, if you look at church history, there's some more kind of surprising date predictions from from some that we would even highly esteem in church history. Uh, The the, the great second century defender of the faith, Irenaeus, made a prediction that Christ would come again in the year 500. Uh, John Wesley, the fiery founder of Methodism, predicted that Christ would return in 1836. Even the wonderful author of the world's best-known hymn, Reformed theologian, slave trade fighter, John Newton. They even got John Newton. He predicted in 1680 that Christ would return by the year 2060. I don't know. We'll see. He said he figured this out by a discovery of hidden codes in the Bible. We began preaching through this chapter five Sundays ago now, and and on that Sunday, we acknowledged that this chapter and its teaching is in some ways mysterious. It can be hard to understand at certain points. There's there's a number of different approaches and interpretations that have been taken with this chapter and its teaching throughout church history, And, and, and we saw that this chapter has often been approached with a kind of vain curiosity and and has been misused to promote vain speculation in certain Christian circles. We said that we hope that, that our approach to this chapter and in, in our time in this chapter would, would, would be one not in which vain curiosity and speculation drives us or is promoted. We said that our, our, our hope was simply to expose the message of this chapter and to apply it to our lives as Christ's disciples. The point of this chapter being not that we might understand current events better and how they relate to the return of Christ, or to, to see how this chapter fits in with whatever end time scheme we have, or so that we could fill out our end times charts a little more accurately. The point of this chapter is to help and aid us and all of God's people in living faithfully as followers of Christ in the time that God has given us. And in our passage this morning, in which Christ concludes the content of this chapter, that's precisely what he says. Here he discourages vain speculation and curiosity over the specific timing of his return and the surrounding events and all of that, and instead he encourages a spiritual wakefulness and faithfulness in the lives of his disciples. And I think you'll see this plainly with me as, as we look at our passage this morning. The big idea here is that Jesus will return suddenly at an unknown time, stay awake, and our outline to, to unpack this big idea and passage is first... We don't know the time, but second, we do know our task. But first, we we don't know the time. See here how we don't know and can't know the timing of Christ's return. Verse 32 begins our passage with Jesus saying, but concerning that day or that hour, if you'll recall with me, that day and that hour is a phrase used in contrast with, with what this chapter is continually called, these things. Whenever you see that phrase, these things in this chapter, it's a clear reference to the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem in the year 70 AD and all of the surrounding events there. And those events were such that you could discern something of the timing because of the various signs the disciples were to be looking for that would tell them the time was drawing near. But but that was in reference to these things, not that day. When Jesus says that day, he's clearly talking about a different day. He's talking about the day of his return, the hour of his return. And the Bible often speaks of the day of Christ's return in the final judgment as that day. You can see Matthew 7.22, Mark 14.25, Luke 10.12, Romans 2.16, 1 Thessalonians 5.4, and more. And all of those passages and more of them speak of that day as the day of Christ's return in the final judgment. 
And remember that Jesus is speaking of that day here in our passage and also in verses 23 to 27 because the disciples had asked him about that day. And the disciples question, as it's recorded in Matthew 24, 3, they ask, tell us, when will these things be? In reference to his, his prophecy about the temple's destruction. And then they also ask, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So they've also asked, not just about the timing of the temple's destruction, but about the timing of Christ's return. And concerning the timing of that day, Jesus says, no one knows. No human being knows the timing of that day. Not Joseph Smith or William Miller, not Jerry Falwell or Hal Lindsey or Harold Camping, not even Irenaeus or John Wesley, not even our blessed hymn writer, John Newton. No human being knows, no one knows, Jesus says. And that, that really ought to be sufficient for us when we see Christ say that no human being knows the timing of that day. We ought to be content with our ignorance of it. But Jesus drives this point home even more for us. He says, hey, listen, not even the angels in heaven know the timing of that day. And you go, really? Not even the angels in heaven? Is it, are, are, aren't the angels in heaven, aren't they going to be returning with you? Yeah, you remember Mark eight thirty eight. Jesus is going to return in the glory of his Father with the holy angels? As we saw earlier in this chapter, in verse 27, the angels are going to return with Christ and he's going to send them out to gather his elect from the ends of the earth. The angels are going to return with Christ. And what's more, is not only are they going to return with Christ, but they are those which minister in the very presence of God. Angels are beings that are are, are superior to human nature and have a superior ministry in some ways, and, 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 and they have a knowledge that human beings can't even begin to fathom or understand, and yet, Jesus says, not even they know the timing of that day. And again, that should suffice for us. We should go, well, you know, not even the angels know the timing of Christ's return. As those who will be returning with him, as those who have a superior nature to us, as those who minister in the presence of God, why should we know then? Let's be content with our ignorance if it's an ignorance shared even with the holy angels of heaven. And yet, Christ presses this home for us even more. It's like he, it's like he knew how tempted we would be to get a date on that calendar. And so he says, not even the Son knows. Referring to himself. You can see how that It's going from lesser to greater. No one knows. The angels don't even know. The Son, as the one superior to all, the one superior even to the holy angels of heaven, as such, he doesn't know. He's going to be the one returning. He's the one in whom God has accomplished our full salvation. He's the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. He's the one in whom God has entrusted all authority even to judge on that last day. He's the one whose appearance and coming we await, and yet he says, nor the Son. Not even the Son knows the date of his very own return here. John Calvin summarizes the very point we're to be getting from Jesus here so well when he said that we ought to worry no more than the Lord over the details of time. Of course, this brings up an issue for us here. Some of us might tend to stumble over Christ's ignorance of the date of his return here. The line of thought being, Well, God is omniscient, right? That means God is all-knowing. He's omniscient. He knows all things. 1 John 3.20 says it very clearly. He knows everything. Well, if God knows everything and Jesus says he doesn't know something here, then does that mean Jesus isn't God? What's going on here? Well, we should remember that as our Savior, Jesus, he's truly divine, but he's also truly human. True, he is, he is divine. He's the only begotten son of God, but he's also truly human, born of the Virgin Mary. The Chalcedonian definition hammered out to the Council of Chalcedon in the year 451 just puts it wonderfully, it formulates this doctrine so beautifully in a, in a way that keeps us from error concerning Christ's identity while also maintaining this beautiful mystery we find in the Bible about Christ's identity. And it, we find a biblical confession that Christ is one person. He's one person. 
and that this same one person is perfect in deity, and the same one person is perfect in humanity. The same one is true God and true man, comprising a rational soul and a body. He is of the same essence of the Father according to his deity, and the same one is of the same essence with us according to his humanity, like us in all things except sin. In other words, Christ is one person with two natures. One person with two natures, and the, the, the Chalcedonian definition goes on to say that these two natures are united unconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. Here's what that means. That means that these two natures remain distinct from one another. They don't blend or weld or mesh together, and yet these two natures are still united in the singular personhood of Christ. So these two nations, listen, are distinct but united, and in speaking of Christ in this way, we maintain that he's both truly God and truly man, right? If the natures are blended together, if his divine nature was blended with his human nature, then he would be less than divine while also more than human. And, and if we believe that, we would lose the precious doctrine of the incarnation. So we need to hold to this. Christ is one person with two distinct natures. Now, part of what it means to be truly human then is to be ignorant of some things, right? Right? Christ in his divinity undoubtedly knows all things. In his divinity, he's omniscient. He knows everything, even the timing of his return. But at times in the Gospels, in reference to his human nature, the authors of the Gospels will speak of Christ. Of, he, he doesn't know some things. In Luke 2.52, the evangelist says that Christ, as he was growing up, grew in wisdom and in stature. That means he learned some stuff as he was growing up. It's not possible for God, who is omniscient, to learn things because he's all-knowing. There's nothing for him to learn, but in Christ's humanity, in his human nature, there were things he needed to learn. Throughout Mark's gospel, we've seen Christ ask questions like, who touched me in Mark 5.30? Or to the disciples, how many loaves and fishes do you have in Mark 8.5? It's not just that. But in reference to Christ's human nature, in Mark 4, 28, didn't we see Jesus tired and needing to take a nap? And in Matthew 4, 2, when Jesus was in the wilderness, it says that Jesus was hungry. In John 19, 38, as he's dying on a cross, we find Jesus thirsty. Now, does the, does the Son of God in his divinity get tired and need to take a nap? In his divinity, does he need to eat food because he's hungry or, or need to drink because he's thirsty? Absolutely not. Just as in his divine nature, he's not ignorant of anything. But in his human nature, Christ can get tired. He can get hungry. He can get thirsty. And he can be ignorant of some information, even about the specific timing of his return, all while his divine nature knows all things. And his divine nature does not automatically impart omniscience to his human nature because then we wouldn't have a truly human nature in Christ. And so, in Christ humbling himself for us in the incarnation, he truly takes on a human nature. And in his human nature, he's not omnipotent, omnipresent. He does get tired. He does get hungry. He is confined to space and time. And in his human nature, he didn't know the timing of his return. And again, part of the point of his saying this is that we would then be content to not know the timing ourselves. If, if no one knows, not even the angels, not even the Son and his human nature, then shouldn't we rest contented in the fact that we don't and can't and shouldn't know as well? And then, just to press the point home even more, in case we still didn't get it, he repeats this two more times. In verse 33, he says, you don't know when the time will come. Verses 35 and 36, he says, you don't know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly. We don't know the time. We can't know the time. And if no one knows, not even the angels nor the sun and his human nature, then ought we be content with our not knowing as well? Because you know who does know is the Father. And the Father has a perfect plan for our full salvation and the second coming of His Son, for the final judgment of the living and the dead that we confessed earlier. 
for the resurrection of our bodies that we confessed earlier, for the establishment of a new heavens and a new earth wherein all things are made new and every tear is wiped from our eyes. God has a perfect plan for this with perfect timing. And so what we're called to in the meantime is to trust him and rest in whatever his plan is, to be content with what his word has revealed to us. We believe here that that God's word is sufficient, beloved. It it, it gives us all we need for salvation, for lives of godliness. And apparently what God says we don't need for salvation and lives of godliness is the timing of the end. And in fact, it's, it's actually in our very ignorance of the timing that we find a reason for godly living here. As Jesus goes on to tell us that while we don't know the time, we do know our task. And it's in light of our ignorance of the timing that we're given reason for our task. And in light of the, the coming day and in light of our ignorance of its timing, Jesus says we're to stay awake. That's our task. We know this. It's, it's abundantly clear here. Jesus says in verse 33 that in light of our ignorance of that day, we should be on guard, keep awake, for because you don't know when the time will come. You don't know when the time will come, so therefore be on guard, keep awake. Our ignorance is what motivates our initiative here to stay awake. He says, be on guard. We're translated there. means to to watch out, to keep alert. Constant vigilance, Matt-Eye Moody says. And Jesus says it here. The word for, for keep awake means much the same. It's it's aptly translated. It's actually the word from which we get the name Gregory. Apparently, Gregory was a a very common name among Christians in the first and second centuries because Christians recalled Christ's words here and they wanted daily reminders in the names of their children to stay awake, to remain vigilant, to remain alert, to not grow sleepy or dull or weary in the things of God. Now, we've some have taken this, this call to stay awake and to be on guard here as an encouragement to do precisely what Jesus is telling us not to do in our passage this morning. And that's to constantly keep an eye out for signs and try to discern with more and more accuracy the specific time when Christ's return is drawing near. It's not what Jesus is saying here. He's saying that since we don't know the time, we should be marked by a constant readiness and a faithfulness in the work he's given us to do. And I'll say that again because it's really the the point here. He's saying that since we don't know the time, we should be marked by a constant readiness and a faithfulness in the work he's given us to do. And this is what the, the, the parable in verses 35 to 36 shows us so clearly about what Jesus means by stay awake. He says it's like a man going on a journey When he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake, he says, therefore, stay awake, for you don't know when the master of the house will come in the evening or midnight or rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. He says that the period between his ascending to heaven and his being seated at the right hand of the Father and the day of his return is like a man who leaves his home. And when he leaves his home, he, he leaves his, his servants in charge of the house. That word for charge there is the, the word uh, that we get uh, often translated as power or authority. They've been given authority and power over his house. They've been given charge of his house in his absence. They've been given authority and power as well as work. Each with his work, they says. They've been left with each with his work. He says they they each have their appointed duties. They each have their appointed occupation. And they each have the needed authority and power to do their duties. There's delegated tasks as well as delegated authority and power to do the tasks. And the tasks and the authority to do the tasks are all given from the master to each of his servants. And he says to the doorman, don't fall asleep. You don't know when the master's coming, so be constantly ready, constant readiness and faithfulness in the work that you've been given to do. And then, just in case 
Someone is in danger of being confused here and, and thinking that this call to stay awake is just a call to the apostles to whom Jesus was speaking here. Jesus wants to make it abundantly clear. He's not just exhorting the apostles to stay awake. Verse 37, he says, and what I say to you, I say to all, to everyone, stay awake. Remember, this, this, this was originally addressed to the disciples, Peter, James, John, Andrew. But what Jesus says to them here on the Mount of Olives in the first century, 30 to 33 AD, somewhere in there, he says to all of his disciples everywhere, stay awake. Do you see the point here? Verse 33, stay awake. Verse 34, stay awake. Verse 35, stay awake. Verse 37, stay awake. Has he gotten the point across? This repetition is meant to drive the point home into our minds and hearts. In light of his return and in light of our ignorance of it, we're to stay awake, being constantly ready and faithful in the work he's given us to do. Now, it's, it's abundantly clear here that we're to stay awake what does that look like in our lives? What does it look like for a life, for a person to stay awake? For one, it's, it's plainly evident here that we're each to complete our God-given work. We're each to complete our God-given work. You know, this is part of what staying awake means. But as Sinclair Ferguson points out in this passage here, there's an element of, of responsibility and individuality. He puts his servants in charge each with his work, each one being given his own work. Each of us are, are given specific God-given work that we're to give ourselves to and occupy ourselves with until Christ, the Lord of the house, returns. And hear me, I, I believe he's speaking of work specifically done in the church, for the church, for the people of God. In the church, i.e. the master's house, we're each given specific work as well as specific gifts and abilities to carry out our work. In fact, many in, 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 in the early church interpreted the reference to the doorkeeper in this parable as speaking specifically to the office of pastors, the one who, who keeps watch over those entering and going out of the church. Whether it's reading too much in the passage or not, I'll leave that to your judgment, but, but I think they did have one thing right, and that's that the, the master's house seems to be a reference to the church, the household of God. And so a clear reference, or a clear imperative, rather, from our text is this. Use your God-given gifts to serve God's people. Use your God-given gifts to serve God's people. You each have gifts, abilities, power to serve in certain ways. And you were given those gifts. They're not actually your gifts. Those gifts belong to the church. Those gifts are meant to be used in service to the church. Are you using your gifts, your abilities, your powers, in a way that builds up and edifies and serves the people of God. Christian, church member, you have something particular to give to the church. You've been given a work as well as an authority and power to do that work, and it's been given to you by the master of the house for the household itself. And then additionally, to just kind of maybe balance this out a little bit, there's a God-given work in the world that we're given as well. We find this in a closely paralleled passage, Mark 1, or uh, not Mark 1, Acts 1, 6 through 8. There in Acts 1, Jesus has died and risen. He's been with the disciples teaching for 40 days, and he's about to ascend to heaven and be seated at God's right hand of the king of overall. And, and, and before that happens, the disciples ask Jesus, is it now the time for you to restore the kingdom to the, to the people of Israel? And and I just imagine what's going through Jesus' mind at this point. These guys still don't get it, do they? He's literally just told them in the Olivet Discourse not too long ago that you don't know. He responds by saying something very similar to what he says in our passage. He says, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In other words, you don't, you don't need to know the timing of the end, but you'll have a task. Be my witnesses, be my representatives here locally and to the ends of the earth. Is be, be 
at, at work in my church and be my witnesses to the ends of the earth, and you'll have all the power needed to do so when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you. The same is true for us today, friends. We've, we've been indwelled and empowered by the Holy Spirit for this purpose of representing Christ here in the city of Dayton and to the ends of the earth, and we each have our own part to play in that God-given work. You have been placed by God's sovereignty, by his providence to live in a particular house, to work in a particular job, to live in a particular neighborhood and frequent particular places and establishments, all in God's providence so that we might represent Christ there. What's more, some of us are called to leave those particular houses and jobs and neighborhoods to go to the ends of the earth so that we might complete our God-given work of representing him and living as his witnesses to the ends of the earth. This is part of what it means to stay awake, to each complete our God-given work. Next, second, in order to, to stay awake, we're to consecrate our whole lives in light of the Master's return. Again, Sinclair Ferguson puts it well when he, he writes that this is one of the cardinal principles of, of true Christian living, to live every day in light of Christ's certain return, to do everything, yes, everything, for his inspection, everything we do should in some way reflect the grace and glory of Christ and be part of our witness to him. Jonathan Edwards, something of an example for us in this. He was just 12, 13 years old. He, he, he compiled a list of resolutions for his life. It makes me ashamed to read them as a 34-year-old. These were things he was resolved to do for as long as his life endured. One of them, resolution 19, was this, resolved never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if I expected it would not be above an hour before I should hear the last trump. In other words, he was resolved to never do anything that he would be afraid to do within an hour of Christ's return. He would seek to live in light of the imminence of Christ's return at every moment. That's how we're to live. Perhaps that's, that's a truth that, that we might use in our fight against certain besetting sins? Are there, are there certain sinful habits you have that would be helped by this reality, knowing that you would not want to be found doing or saying or thinking if it were an hour within Christ's return? Perhaps this is a truth you might use to, to better organize your calendar, your budget. Christ's return should be this, this overarching, organizing principle of our lives. Does your calendar, your budget reflect that? Perhaps the imminence of Christ's return should right now motivate you to do something specific that you've been putting off, reconciling with an offended or offending brother or sister. Sharing the gospel with a, a friend or family member who needs to hear, devoting yourself to some ministry initiative you felt nudged by the Lord to do but have been putting off for whatever reason, consecrate your whole life in light of Christ's return. Third, though, and something of a contrast or uh, probably more of a caveat to that, I should say, I'd also encourage you to continue in just the ordinary duties and delights of life. Martin Luther, you know, he was once asked what he would do if, if he knew that Christ was going to return the very next day. He said that he would plant a garden. You know, that can seem counterintuitive to, to some of us. And I wonder if that's because some of us have deficient views of our ordinary duties and delights in everyday life. Sometimes this, this exhortation to stay awake like this and, and to be about our master's business can be mistaken as a denigration of working a nine to five or doing the dishes or changing a diaper or taking a nap or planting a garden when this shouldn't be interpreted that way at all. It's a common mistake. It's actually a mistake we see in the church of Thessalonica. If you look at 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 to 15, it seems that some of the Thessalonians had actually quit their jobs because they thought that Christ would return soon and they thought that their jobs were just not spiritual enough of an activity to continue doing when Christ's return was near? Perhaps they reason that if Jesus were to return, they would be better found doing something really spiritual like praying or reading their Bibles instead of planting a garden or running a business. And yet that, that fails to take into account that whatever your job is, whatever your various callings are, 
whatever your vocations are, that is part of your God-given work that you are to complete and that you're to complete in service to Christ and for the glory of Christ. The Lord has ordained our work at school and in vocations and in the home. He has ordained your, your times of study, your times of toil, your times of doing dishes and changing diapers and making meals and all of it. All of this is ordained by our Creator God. The goal then is not to devote ourselves to only what we typically call spiritual things while discarding what we consider to be more ordinary things. The goal is to devote all things more and more to the glory of Christ. Go to work and work hard as a servant of Christ, as Paul says in Colossians 3.22. Change diapers and do dishes and prepare meals and do so knowing that Christ is pleased when it's rendered as loving service to him and to those under your care. When you get really tired from all your work, which is bound to happen, take a nap and do it for the glory of God. Please don't take stay awake too literally here. Take a nap. It's good to take a nap. It's good to rest your body so that you can continue being faithful in the work God has given you. The call here is to be constantly ready and faithful in the work God has given to us. And sometimes that work includes planting a garden for the pleasure of Christ, knowing that God delights in gardens. He planted one in the beginning. He likes gardening. It's good. Devote yourself to those duties, those delights, friends, for the glory and pleasure of Christ and render it all as service to Him. But then we also remember that spiritual habits are also important to devote ourselves to in an effort to remain awake. We also ought to commit ourselves to holy habits. At, at times, Christians can hear encouragements like I just gave and, and think that since all of life can and ought to be sanctified to Christ, then holy habits like prayer and Bible engagement and gathering with the church are unnecessary and superfluous. Let's not make that mistake. Some early copies of Mark here in verse 33 give the added exhortation, be on guard, stay awake, and pray. Perhaps your translation includes that added exhortation to stay awake and pray. And even if it's not in the original manuscripts, it's still good instruction. And even if it's not explicitly commanded here in, in Mark, it actually is in Luke's parallel to this passage in Luke 21, 36. Part of staying awake involves praying, according to Luke 21, 36. Part of staying awake, Luke 21, 36 says, involves praying faithfully and asking the Lord to give you strength to stay awake. And in my experience, friends, I've, I've found that I'm more faithful in devoting all of those ordinary activities to the glory and pleasure of Christ when I'm more faithful in prayer in regular times in God's Word to stay awake and pray. Stay awake by praying. And furthermore, there's another exhortation in Scripture in light of this coming day. It's in Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. The author of Hebrews says there, And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Don't neglect meeting together. It, even then in the first century, it was already some people's habit to neglect assembling with the people of God. And the author of Hebrews says, don't, don't neglect it. Don't neglect meeting together, but encourage one another. Gather all the more as you see that day drawing near. What, what day is that? The day of Christ's return. We're to gather faithfully in an effort to encourage one another and stir one another up to love and good works, all in anticipation of Christ's imminent return. We're to be faithful in gathering in order to help one another and strengthen one another to stay awake for that day. Stay awake and pray. Commit yourself to holy habits and rhythms of life that strengthen you and fortify you and invigorate you to stay awake. And then lastly, one of those rhythms should be to contemplate the return of Christ often. Contemplate His return Remember that the disciples here, they've been hearing throughout this all of it discourse about the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem, the trials and tribulations that, that they'd be going through during that time, about their coming persecution, about all the suffering that would characterize that period. It was going to be horrid. 
And notice here how Jesus punctuates all this teaching with a reminder that his return is certain, is imminent, and will eventually inevitably come. Why does he do this? For one, he does it so that when the disciples are tempted to grow weary or sleepy or slothful in their work, when their work was met by nothing but opposition or persecution, and when it's hard and they're growing tired, the news of the return of Christ was meant to serve as smelling salts to awaken them for their remaining work. In this way, it was meant to sober the disciples, to give them a clear-mindedness concerning their remaining task on this earth. And then likewise, it was meant to, to gladden them. Because remember what we saw when we looked at verses 23 to 27 concerning the return of Christ. That day is going to be a, great, a day of great salvation for God's elect. That day is going to be the day of our rejoicing. It's going to be the day of our reward for those who stay awake till the end. It will be a day of salvation. The Apostle Paul speaks to this same reality when he writes to Pastor Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 8. Listen to what he says there. He says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. In other words, I'm going to be dying soon. I'm going to be going soon. But he says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. He says, I have persevered. I've stayed awake. I've continued in my God-given work. And so he says, henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. What a sweet way to, to speak about Christians as those who love his appearing. You see, that day for Paul, for the apostles, for disciples of Christ, for all who love his appearing, it's a day of reward, of salvation, of rejoicing, a day in which we will receive a crown of righteousness if we stay awake. You see how this teaching concerning that day is meant here to gladden and woo our hearts into staying awake? So friends, contemplate this day often as a way of, of sobering yourself. Contemplate this day and, 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 and view it as smelling salts for your soul to awaken you and invigorate you and to give you a clear-headedness about this life and your purpose in it. But then also contemplate this day often to gladden your heart. To remind you that it's, it's the day in which you're going to see your Savior. You're going to see the one who died in your place for your sins. You're going to see the one who rose for you as the first fruits of your very own resurrection on that day. It's the day you're going to see the one who has ascended on high and pleads before the throne of grace for your full and absolute acquittal on that day. On that day, you'll see the one who will wipe away every tear from our eyes, who will make an end to all of our suffering and sin, the one who will make all things new. Is it any wonder that Christians would be called those who loved his appearing? Because it will be the day in which our joy is full and overflowing, and so contemplate it now as a way of gladdening you into watchfulness and wakefulness. We don't know when that day is going to come. But we know that that glad day is coming. May it sober us. May it gladden us now. So be on guard. Stay awake. Let's pray. We say with the Spirit and with the Bride, Lord, come quickly. May that day come quickly. We want to see our Savior. We want to see our Master. We want to see our Lord. But even now, as we've heard his words in Mark 13, 32 through 37, and as we are about to behold something of his broken body and his shed blood at the table, would you strengthen us? Would you revitalize us to stay awake until that day comes? In the name of our Master and Savior, we ask these things. Amen.